Let's start with Colossians. The thanksgiving sets the tone. Starting in verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You recognize those three from 1 Corinthians 13. You'll see them elsewhere in the New Testament. They are a Pauline theme. Faith and hope and love belong together. Note that in these verses, hope is foundational. Our hope that's laid up for us where Christ is in heaven is the foundation, really the genesis of our love for one another and our trust in God. And this is all part and parcel of the gospel. Of this you've heard before in the word of truth, the good news which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it's bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. It's out of Paul's gratitude for the Colossians' faith that he writes this letter. Verse 9, So, from the day we heard, we haven't ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing fruit, being strengthened with all power. There you have why Colossians is being written. Paul has heard of the harvest of faith in this group of believers that Epaphras is responsible for, and he just wants to encourage them and help them grow. And what Paul wants to do is help the Colossians appreciate and honor Christ's significance to everything, his omni-significance, his omni-relevance. In 2.2, Paul says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul is going to guide the Colossians through that storehouse of Christ's treasures. As you've probably noticed, I've highlighted in chapter 1 and actually through all of Colossians, all the occurrences of a word, the word all in Greek, pas or panta. We use this word in English all the time as a prefix. A pandemic, for instance, is something that is occurring in all people all over the place. The word all recurs throughout Colossians. Paul is banging it like a bell to help the Colossians understand the comprehensive nature of Jesus' relevance and rule. So let's do a quick word study and examine the way that the word all shows up and the role it plays in Colossians. In the greeting, you've already seen it a couple of times. Now, some of these uses might just be incidental, but watch the theme develop. In verse 4, we've heard the love that you have for all the holy ones, all the Christians, not just in Colossae, but everywhere. It's fitting that the Colossians would have this kind of love for all of God's saints because the gospel is bearing fruit in all the world, in verse 6. Paul just wants to ramp that up further in the rest of the letter. We are praying and asking, this is in verse 9, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and understanding. No limit that your walk might be fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, strengthened with all power for all endurance and patience. Paul is praying for no upper limit to the Colossians' faith and life. Then a key transitional verse, 13. God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption. This leads to this remarkable passage starting in verse 15 describing Jesus in terms of all creation, all power, all things, all lordship. What it means for this beloved son to have a kingdom is what comes next, the centerpiece of Colossians, the hymn that starts at 115. Notice how much all language there is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You could also translate that over all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Significant language for what's coming in the letter and what I want to draw out. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is creation language. This is Genesis language. Paul wants us to see Jesus as responsible for the creation itself. But he doesn't keep this at the abstract global level. It's going to channel down right into the lives of the audience. 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. You'll see this developed at length in Ephesians. 
He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The Christians in Colossae are among those things, those ones who are reconciled through him. The next section shows how that connection happened through the gospel that they heard that had been proclaimed and has been and is still being proclaimed in all creation under heaven. The Greek could also be rendered to every creature under heaven, which makes more sense of the under heaven phrase. So those Colossians who heard that word of the gospel of the hope laid up for them and who trusted in it and are living out that trust with lives of love, they are among the reconciled ones who respect Jesus's rule over all things and who can look forward to resurrection in him. I have a picture to show you, an icon, in fact, one of the earliest Christian icons. It's called a Christ Pantocrator, Christ ruler or Lord of all. This is from a monastery in Sinai. It's one of the most famous and earliest Christian Orthodox icons. You'll notice Jesus's asymmetrical face. The left side looks different from the right side. A lot of people think this is meant to represent his weakness, his humanity on our left and his power, his deity on the right. It's a stronger half of his face. That means this picture pretty eloquently tells the story of this hymn in Colossians, that not only is he the creator responsible for everything, but as a human being, he rose from the dead, that he might be first and preeminent in all things, even human things, that he might be the firstborn from the dead, the first one to complete the human journey, and who pioneers it for the rest of us who in him can complete that human journey to resurrection. If I scroll down through the rest of Colossians, you'll see just how much more of this all language there is. We're still in chapter one. And as I move through to the end of one and the beginning of two, Paul says, we proclaim him warning all people and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. By the way, the comprehensive scope of this language in Colossians has fueled a movement in Christianity called universalism, the teaching that all people are saved. I'm not going to draw that conclusion from this language, especially because Paul includes warnings and many other instructions that don't indicate an expectation that all creatures will be saved. Instead, the verses that I just read actually sound better if you understand the all or every language to mean something like any. I warn anyone and teach anyone with all wisdom that I may present anyone mature in Christ. There are no limits or boundaries in Paul's ministry. He will go anywhere with the gospel, which is for everyone. Back to scrolling through Colossians. In 2.3 is the verse we started with. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and all knowledge. Another appeal to his deity in 2.9. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and all authority. At the end of chapter 2, Jesus is the head of all his body, all the church. And then in chapter 3, because there's no limit to Jesus's domain, no limit to where his power belongs, we are to put all old things, all obsolete things away in 3.8. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscenity, lies. Because we've put on the new self, this is now in 10, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Again, Jesus the creator. Here, in Christ, there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But this is a key phrase. Christ is all and in all. So because the whole body belongs to him and because he pertains to everything, all of our lives belong to him. All of our conduct is his at his disposal. And we can look forward to transformation in everything. So we should put away every vice and we should embrace every virtue. And above all these, we should put on love, which binds them all together and live whole lives, doing everything we do in the name of the Lord Jesus. These are personal qualities, but they're also relational qualities because relationships belong to our Pantocrator too. So Colossians 3 traces the same ground you're going to see in Ephesians 5 about relationships, especially unequal power relationships, wives and husbands, children and parents, 
slaves or bond servants and masters. And the all language shows up there too. Children, obey your parents in all things. Bond servants or slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. There's all language in chapter four, but it doesn't seem relevant to the theme. Tychicus will come and tell you everything. Well, he's not gonna tell them all things. He's just gonna tell them everything they need to hear. So in just a few chapters, Paul has covered astonishing ground, really all ground. All creation, all things are in him. In his body, people from all nations and all walks of life are reconciled. All social orders, all principalities, powers, and authorities. By the way, both secular ones and spiritual ones. His rule pertains, of course, to all of his followers, and it lasts for all time. Colossians is really giving us a story of everything, and Ephesians will do it too. Christ is all, and Christ is in all. A lot of us want to restrict Jesus' relevance to heaven or to the things that get us to heaven. But Colossians has a very different picture. Creation's story is not so much of us getting away from this world to God or heaven or else being separated forever. Colossians' story is of God entering into the different orders of creation. Philippians 2 and Ephesians 4 and Revelation 5 speak of heaven and earth and under the earth the sort of three layers of creation as far as our perspective, above us, where we are, and below us where the dead go. Well, God has entered into each of those realms and brought his glory into those places, at least temporarily in the case of the grave, where he has gone and where he has rescued the dead from, and eternally, not just in heaven where he dwells, but on earth where he dwells. The uncreated eternal God beyond all time and space that belongs to creation, both made a creation that's not him and then entered into it, entered into what the Old Testament thinks of as the third heaven or the heaven of heavens, and then in a lesser way in the temple and the tabernacle and in a greater way in the incarnation of the word, God entered into earthly creation as a bodily participant in it. And the story of Jesus in his incarnation, his ascension back into heaven, bringing his earthly humanity with him and making it heavenly humanity in his ascension. And then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon and in the church. And later, Jesus's parousia or his appearing. All of those are exchanges where God is present to all and in all. As far as under the earth, well, Jesus was dead for three days and participated in human death and is coming to rescue the dead in him, emptying out the world's cemeteries and the sea gives up its dead. It's not clear that under the earth is an eternal dwelling place for the Lord. It is clear that heaven and earth are reconciled and that God dwells fully in both eternally. That is the story of God and God's creation that you're hearing in Colossians 3 and is getting mentioned again in Ephesians 4 that God might fill all in Christ. So try not to think of the gospel as news of a rescue operation that will lift us off of planet Earth and out of our human existence. That is not the gospel. And it's certainly not the story here. I've already mentioned how many times the New Testament writings follow an indicative imperative pattern where the first half, more or less, describes how things are. And then the second half describes how it follows from how things are to how we ought to behave. Well, all of this indicative in Colossians 1 and 2, there was a little imperative there, but all of the indicative in Colossians 1 and 2 channels through to an imperative. Here is an encapsulation of that imperative, 220. If with Christ you died to the world, we'll leave it there for now, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to earthly rules and regulations? No. 3.1. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. What he's saying is, we are represented now at the center of God's power and authority, where the Pantocrator is, at the right hand of God in heaven. 
we are represented there by our risen Christ, and our future is hidden there in him. So it's safe, and so we can look forward to it. That's the hope that's laid up for us. We can walk that green line, even while we also exist on the red line of old creation, by putting to death what aspects of that old life are incompatible with resurrection, vices, rules and regulations that have no permanent eternal value. We can put away the stuff that doesn't matter and doesn't last and doesn't help, and we can embrace the qualities that Jesus has for us, the spiritual gifts and the virtues that equip us for that eternity on the green line once the red line is done and over with forever. In our age, that advice might sound a little odd. Paul has just expansively unpacked the way that Jesus rules over all creation. Why then does he focus only, practically, on life within this little community of Colossian believers? Why not channel that transformative power, that omni-significance into changing society, changing the Roman Empire, changing the world, changing all creation. Maybe it's because the church was too young and small to do anything about those things. Maybe. In that case, as the church grows in power and in numbers in the next few centuries, it becomes appropriate for it to reach into domains like the state, the economy, etc., and flex its muscle. On the other hand, Paul says, your lives are hidden with Christ in God, and when he appears, you'll appear with him in glory. Maybe all of this omni-significance is channeled into the life of a Christian community because what's hidden remains hidden until Jesus comes back. In that case, how many Christians there are in the world, whether it's a handful or two billion, how much social power Christians have, whether it's a lot or nothing, how much influence we have outside the church's circles is irrelevant. However you interpret the implications, the church is visible both to the broader society and to all creation. How they live and believe and hope and love is visible beyond their own numbers. It's meant to be. An image for the way that Colossians as well as Ephesians takes this unimaginably vast reality and funnels it into something manageable and tangible well, there's a funnel, but I want to give you a different image. A telescope takes what is so vast and so far away that it's unimaginable and invisible to human eyes, and it renders it human-scaled, tangible, and therefore intelligible. The lives and testimonies of the saints in Colossae and in everywhere else are telescopes. They are taking this invisible heavenly reality and bringing it into a place where ordinary people can see it and come to some understanding. But not just individual lives, the community of saints at Colossae demonstrates the reality of the kingdom and their ascended king, and their ascension in a sense with that king. So a grander telescope might be in order. The Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, recently decommissioned, strikes me as a decent image of something on earth that's big by human scale, and that would be a local community or even the whole church community, whose size is really infinitesimal compared to the thing that it's reflecting and conveying. Think of the Colossians individually as telescopes, kind of small personal ones that you can put in your yard, and think of the Church of the Saints as a vast telescope like the Arecibo telescope, and I think you'll have an image for how it makes sense that this enormous reality of the kingdom is being scaled to human size so that fellow human beings can understand it. I want to show you one way that this visibility and focus on oneself and on one's own community plays out in human history. And it concerns a name in the last chapter of Colossians. That name is Onesimus. And he appears as Paul is wrapping things up in chapter 4. Now, I come from a family that would watch a movie all the way to the last credit. People would start leaving the movie theater as soon as the show was over. We always stayed because we paid for them. I mean, you paid for the whole thing. Well, in the Bible, some interesting stuff happens in the credits. So don't just skip them. Don't let your eyes glaze over and move on. Here, Paul is concluding this letter with some instructions. He says, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. I love the guy. And I'm sending him with Onesimus our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. Now, that's a little odd. 
Why would Paul have to tell the Colossians that Onesimus is one of them? You'll find the answer in the shortest letter of Paul's corpus, the letter to Philemon, not written to a church, not written as an encyclical, but written to a slave owner of an escaped slave, Onesimus. I'm not going to rehearse the language of Philemon. It's just a chapter anyway. It would take you less time to read it. I do want to emphasize how Philemon illustrates the concrete implications of this gospel of omni-significance, Jesus' omni-relevance, to the Roman institution of slavery. Paul is writing to the master of this escaped slave who has become a Christian, and Paul's message is, he's your brother now, and since he's your brother now, why not welcome him as a brother instead of property? Paul has a good relationship with Philemon as well as Onesimus. He's been spiritually important to both. He handles this situation diplomatically and gently, but firmly. On the one hand, he wants to persuade Philemon to take back Onesimus as a brother and give him his freedom. On the other hand, he wants to remind Onesimus that he owes Paul his very self. So Paul is going to say, don't make me force this. I shouldn't have to force this. You know what the right thing to do is. Go ahead and do it. And that makes sense because Philemon didn't do anything wrong. It was Onesimus who was escaped. And Paul says, nevertheless, he should be pardoned because of who he is now in Christ. Notice what Paul is not doing in this letter, nor in Colossians, nor in Ephesians. He is not questioning the institution of Roman slavery. What he's doing is more subtle and more consistent with his theology. He's explaining that in Christ, if Christ is all and in all, and if there's no slave or free in him, then really there's no room for slavery within Christian fellowship. Brotherhood and sisterhood trump slavery. They trump the kind of exploitive relationships that are part of that red line. They're part of that old order destined to die. The green line, the line of new creation, is one of mutuality in Christ, who holds all things under his own rule. That's how Paul has framed relations between slaves and masters in Colossians 3 and 4. Slaves or bondservants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Work as for the Lord and not for human beings, knowing that you'll receive the inheritance from the Lord as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, and the wrongdoer, the abusive owner, will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. And you can imagine slave owners nodding their heads and saying, that's right, that's how to be a good servant. But then look what happens in 4.1. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. See, if we're all working for the Lord, then masters and slaves are really in the same relationship with the Lord. And we're accountable for loving one another and building one another up because, after all, we are all fellow servants of our common Lord Jesus. In Colossians and in Philemon and in Ephesians, Paul is too gentle for abolitionists. He will not question the legitimacy of this institution, which is not a good institution. Elsewhere, you've seen in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, if you can get your freedom, get your freedom. It's a more appropriate way to live under Jesus's lordship. It's not a good or healthy institution, although it's not as bad as American chattel slavery was. Nevertheless, Paul is too gentle for abolitionists. He refuses to condemn the institution as such. But Paul is also too clear for slave owners, at least Christian ones. In Christ's arrangement, in Christ's body, there is not room for this kind of institution. That church focused on one another out of reverence for Jesus, their common Lord, was visible. That witness slowly starved and ended the institution of slavery. I think it's quite possible that the life of the church as it pursues the business of serving the Lord in all it does, mainly with respect to living with one another and witnessing to the outside world, gently, if firmly, that that witness is how the cosmic omnisignificance of Jesus influences the world beyond the church and ultimately all creation. Paul is going to say in Ephesians that his ministry isn't just to proclaim good news to human beings on earth. He proclaims the good news to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. 
I think Paul would have understood the life of this little community in Colossae as having cosmic significance in the way that Jesus is going to use it to change the world and to change all creation.